Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's uh, interesting modeling company. A bit of a sober show this week because, unfortunately, uh, over the last couple of days, we've lost two very influential figures within the hobby. Uh, sad to say, we lost uh, Andy Yankus, who was a big name in Aurora uh, model kits. And it found out a couple of days late that, unfortunately, we lost the late and very much great uh, Louis Pruneau as well, who is just yeah phenomenal a phenomenal modeler um and so we're going to talk about andy yankus on another show in fact we are going to be talking about andy yankus with his very good friend matt irvin so hopefully we're going to have matt on the show uh possibly in the next couple of weeks to talk about andy and his work that he did with aurora and just you know his his influence and his legacy but tonight we're going to deal with uh we're going to deal with uh louis pruno louis pruno rather um and I'll, I'll hand it over to Spencer, because Spencer, Spencer, you've met him a couple of times. I have. I have met him. Yeah, I was really shocked about this yesterday. Um, it's, I think within the hobby, within the industry, um, there are a number of people who can be, who can be seen as being great, yeah. in inverted commas, the greats. And um, Shep Payne was one who passed away recently. Francois Verlinden, another one. Yeah. Louis Pruneau, Bob Letterman, um, yeah. two diorama builders from the States, all in that category of great. There are a lot of really good model makers and there are a lot of very influential model makers. I'm not sure that there's more than a handful currently who are perhaps going to be an indelible stamp on the hobby and not because of their technical prowess, but what they created that others have followed. Over, I, think over, throw, over I think I'll throw Bill Horan into that mix uh, as well. Bill Horan, yeah, there's, there's another one. Yeah. Um, and it's the way that they kind of started. I know we could mention Miguel, we could mention mm. Danny Zamavid, we could mention lots of other people, um, all of whom have, you know, in their own way, created a legacy that will be remembered long after they're gone. But these guys are kind of on a different sort of plateau altogether because, because so many people have been influenced by them. And Louis Preneau was 77 years of age, passed away at the weekend, 77. I met him a couple of times at the start of the century um, when I was over in the States at Francois. And Francois Verlinden and Louis Preneau were friends. They'd been friends for a long time. Basically, um, they, they'd met... Um, sort of, it, I think in the sort of mid '80s, as a result of, of Francois doing the books, and he became aware of this guy called Louis Prano, who returned to model making after a break of what seemed like 30 years in 1978, and he decided after he was shown, according to a video I watched last night, he was shown a B17 Flying Fortress diorama. He was so taken with it, he went to a model shop and bought a kit and put this kit together. He said, in his own words, wasn't very good built a diorama around it, wasn't very good, but he was kind of hooked. And then he decided that he would, you know, try and improve his art and his technique. And unlike today, where we've got a lot of social media, we've got a lot of things like we have now that you can watch, you can learn from and all of that sort of stuff. He kind of taught himself, retaught himself and got into the local kind of modeling scene. And then he decided that kits weren't, entirely for him so he thought he would build something from scratch three years after returning to the hobby after this 30-year break and he scratch built a 35th scale dora rail gun that was his first scratch built model three foot long and he became kind of taken with these big rail guns so he took it around the country and he won a gold medal with it and it kind of snowballed. A guy came up to him um, during one of these one of these events and asked him if he would sell it, if he was keen on selling it. He said, well, I've only sort of, sort of just built it, really, and I'd like to see it to some other shows. And he said, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll speak to you about it later. And um, so he said, uh, so this guy rang him a week later and said, look, is that gun for sale? Do you want to sell it? And Lewis said, well, really, massively. He said, I'll give you five for it. And Lewis thought, $500? That's, 
that's kind of a lot of money for a model. And the guy said, no, 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 no. I'll give you $5,000 for this gun. Bearing in mind, this was 1982. So you can, that'll give you some indication of what that was worth in 1982. Lewis took it to the next show and then he sold it to the guy. And this guy then pretty much bought everything from him, all the guns. Then once he'd finished with this, this rail gun, he decided that he was going to build something a little bit bigger. He fancied the idea of something a little bit bigger. Although he built the gun and he put it on a rail line and it was kind of cool. He took it to the shows and all that sort of stuff. He built what was probably his most famous diorama and inarguably one of the most famous 35th scale di dioramas built by anybody ever, I think it's fairly safe to say. And that is the Paris gun that he built as part of a diorama. He built the Paris gun itself. Um, he'd it, the, the diorama is featured in this book, Super Dioramas. And you can see the Paris gun is the one that's in the bottom right hand corner, the bottom picture. And that's the diorama there. It gives you an indication of how big this thing is. He built the diorama, he built the gun. That's the that's the the sort of the the piece that's towards the back of it with the with the raised barrel. He sort of built that and he liked it and he thought that's kind of cool. I've built this Paris gun. I think he found a photograph of it. Um, or a couple of photographs he was sort of taken with it. And he thought, eh, it's a little bit boring as a just as a standalone gun. What shall I do with it? So he did what had never been seen up until that point. He built a factory diorama around this model. And that's the result of it. There you can see the diorama. And this diorama, um, A, was huge in, in, in itself. You can see how big it is with, with Lewis um, laying on the grass next to it. But it was also hugely expensive. He, he spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on Plastruct for this to create the, the essential shape of the factory. And then he built everything else around it. it. Took him about a year, I think, to put this thing together. And it became kind of so famous. He took it to all the shows. He won best in shows left, right and center with this, with this kind of thing. And um, this particular model just cemented his reputation and put his name absolutely at the forefront of the hobby and Francois became aware of the diorama he featured it heavily in the super dioramas book along with another one of Lewis's dioramas of a u-boat being constructed in a in a sort of an underground pen and also one of Bob Letterman's dioramas legacies the first legacies diorama that he did which shows American troops passing through a French town um, during the uh, during the Second World War, which is a massive diorama, which you can see at the top of this. That diorama is something like four foot or five foot by five foot and stands somewhere in the region of about two and a half, three foot tall. It's absolutely immense. Um, and, and Bob and Lewis became friends and they traveled around the US together showing off these, showing off these dioramas. So that was the first kind of thing he did, but it was only really the start. Paris Gun was the start of his his love affair with these big dioramas, but also his love affair with with a lot of um, a sort of, of, of railway guns in particular. He did a lot of railway guns, and we'll come back to another one later on. He did a lot of railway guns, but also he also you can see that's the the U boat that he he built there. He also built a lot of marine subjects as well. A lot of maritime subjects um, crossed. Um, crossed his his bench and he did a lot of ships and a lot of u-boats this is another one um this one was featured in uh, in in Valinden's very first showcase that was published in uh, 1987 and this one is called the capture of the u505 uh, sinking u-boat again another very famous set piece by by lewis um again completely scratch built that was the that was the thing about Lewis's dioramas. He seemingly very rarely built a diorama around a kit. Um, uh, there are some sixteenth scale dioramas that he used. Valendon production sixteenth scale vehicles, including a Stug and a and a Tiger One, that he he built a diorama around that. But the vast majority of his set pieces were 
into almost entirely scratch built. He would use proprietary figures, but they were in, they were almost always heavily converted. These ones here are conversions of stock figures, but each one is different, and he's converted them to create the the the, the stance that he needed. But almost entirely, these things were scratch built. Now, the one thing that it's 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 worth thinking about when you start looking into Lewis Prino's work, and I hope after you've after you've seen this show, you go off and Google his Google his work is the speed with which he built these dioramas. We're not talking about a guy who spent three years putting together a set piece. He was building these in months. He was he was putting things together in months. And he had a very broad brushstroke with a lot of this work in that he wasn't bothered about tiny details. He wasn't bothered about, about being particularly accurate in terms of the outline of, of what he was creating. What he was trying to do is create the illusion of a, a, a setting, a scene, a piece of machinery, something like that. So when a, an onlooker saw the diorama in the round, they would go, oh, I know exactly what that is. That's that's brilliant. If you look at any of his set pieces, sorry, John, I'll, I'll stop yeah. and just say, if you look at any of his set pieces, they're actually, um, you can see that they're made with speed because there aren't fine fixtures and fittings on a lot of them. You'll see... This detail is there, but he's quite happy in the same way that filmmakers will create spaceships quickly and your mind will fill in the blanks. That's what happens with his dioramas. You look at them and you go, yeah, I can see that that's a much more complex thing, but it's enough for me to see the way that he's created it. I'm just going to say it, it was almost it was almost a form of uh, modeling impressionism. That's exactly as, his approach. You know, I've I've been to um, art exhibitions with, uh, there was one a few years ago in Bath that was a local artist, and you see his paintings, and they honestly look like rainy days in Bath with the lights reflecting on the pavement and the everything about them. But when you actually start to go in and look at the details, details mm. aren't there. It's, no. it's, and, and it's not, we're not saying that he just threw anything together. But it, there is a certain thing with these large with these large works that it's it's all about, as you said just now, is they are on such a scale that actually mm. your brain fills in the details. Yes. Details aren't necessarily, sometimes aren't necessarily there because of the expediency of time and just you know the the the, the need to to get this thing finished. But. It, it's that's the beauty of it you are you are looking at it and you are overwhelmed by the detail but mm. your brain is actually like i say it was like a, a form of modeling impressionism it's kind of uh, like trump loy in yes. a lot of cases yeah. um when you're when you're looking at his his work and he built so many of these dioramas there are dozens of them that you that you can take a look at if he did if he'd have not had that approach he, he built a 35th scale section of i think it's uss missouri um at, in pearl harbor bombed completely he built the uh, he built the 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 actual ship there you can see it that diorama is 35th it's enormous absolutely enormous so the idea that he could have built something like that and then he could have detailed it in the same way that you would detail a 54 mil figure that was a standalone piece would just have been uh, um, unthinkable. So when you see this kind of thing, it's about the presence of the of the diorama, about the presence of the scene and the way that it's looked at and around. From what I can gather and, and, and in the, the, the short period of time that I spoke to him, he wasn't interested in people looking at, at small sections of the model and taking those in. These dioramas had to be seen in their entirety in the same way that you would look at a painting mounted on a wall. Mm. He, he wanted you to see the whole thing. And, and as a result of that, although they are extraordinarily complex in their, in their, in their creation and the way that they're, that they're put out there, sometimes you'll look at them and go, well, that's not quite right. You instinctively, because we're so used to very fine details, you think, oh, that's quite simplified in, in there. But then what you're doing is that you're looking at a small picture or, or, a, or an enlarged picture of a small section of a much bigger piece. Mm. And artwork should never be looked at like that. It shouldn't ever 
be looked at like that. That's one of the, I think we've talked about this on the show before. I think that's one of the downsides actually to, to, to kind of the, the model, the modern modeling scene is that you and I, we build things to be looked at in micrometer detail on a big screen. When, when you see the actual, the actual model, you'll see, you know, you'll see this thing, you'll see it like that, that size, and your eyes will not be able to pick it up unless you put a magnifying glass in front of it or whatever. You're, um, talk, you're talking to somebody who has just been spending the best part of two weeks painting three figures, and yeah. it's ridiculous because they are not going to be viewed on a 28-inch monitor at five times the size. Um, no, no, no. Abs absolutely not. And I think, and that's part of the problem that, that we have now. It's, can you see this painting effect that I've put on something that's four mil across? Um, and and I, it was one of the things that, that I tried to get across last year when I was doing the legacy. Um, mm. It wasn't about recreating small sections it was about seeing everything in the round and lewis was very much of that school he was very you know he would he would pick an idea out of thin air and um, one of them is and we've got a photograph of it is a is a river patrol boat um, from the vietnam war i've i've found photographs of similar boats but this boat that he's done now is as much his imagination as it is an actual boat that was used during the vietnam war and he's sort of taken ideas and he's played with those ideas. But if you put that diorama in front of somebody and say, there you go, they're not going to care about that. They're going to look at it and go, oh, that's fabulous. You know, look at it. It's, it's, it captures the whole sort of essence in the same way that, that a sketch would or a, or a, or a painting would capture, capture that essence. And I think, I think Lewis was a genius um, when it came to doing this kind of thing. And and that's why he was so prolific. And and, and Francois once told me that, that Lewis would work in his basement of, of his house. And he would just be surrounded by all sorts of detritus and he'd be surrounded by plastic parts and everything. And he would he would literally sit there and think, right, oh, well, I need this detail. And within half an hour, it'd be sat in his hand because he'd be clipping parts off other things that were they weren't even remotely related to what he needed to build. But by combining those pieces together, all of a sudden he had that he had that detail and he had something that that was usable within the diorama that people would just go, yeah, actually, oh, I can see what that is. That's that's kind of cool. And I think as modern twenty first century modelers that are steeped in in the complexity of the hobby and the complexity of the detail that's now available to us. That is almost so counterintuitive. It's almost difficult to wrap your head around the idea of doing it. And, and the idea that you would, that you would build a model and think, well, yeah, it sort of looks like it rather than, yeah, I've taken this set of plans and I've reduced, I've reduced this model down from this set of plans so that it's accurate it's it's very difficult to wrap your head around that but he literally didn't care he didn't care yeah. about any of those kind of things and as a result of that he created some of the most famous dioramas that in in that in my opinion I, i'm sure in your opinion as well have ever been made um, well we, we've got another one there this is from one of the verlinden way books I'm, i do apologize tonight folks that we've had we've literally had to resort to scavenging whatever photographs we can find out there some of which aren't great quality and some of which we didn't want to kind of uh you know steal too much of other people's intellectual property and everything but yeah this was another one this is from one of the verlinden way books and this was a, a one of a railway gun that he did and I mean, I was a teenager when I got this book. I don't know how many times I must have sat and looked at this and uh, looked at the looked at trying to emulate the effects and the weathering and you know just everything on it. And 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 as you say, we're we're not we're not saying this in a, in a dismissive sense because when now when now when I look at this, I can actually see that to to, to a larger degree, a lot of the weathering on this is done with very broad strokes, mm -hmm. but. That's not the point. It's uh, immediately for a microsecond I might see that, but then instantly my mind blots that all out because it is overwhelmed with just the, the scale of everything that's going on. And it's, you know, I just think that is just absolutely phenomenal modelling. 
I, I've um, got to say, other than of no avail, which I replicated last year with the eighty-eight and the Rat House, yeah. this is my all-time favourite diorama. This, this uh -huh. one, this is called Axis Lend Lease, and it's a depiction of Constance Railway Station. Obviously, you've got this gun in in, in front of it. I'm, I was like you when I got this book. I I I couldn't get past the idea that I wanted to build this diorama. Uh, mm. I've never built a diorama. I still haven't built this diorama. But I've always wanted to build something similar to, to <laughs> this. Um, and, but I have to, you're right what you say about, about the, the kind of broad brush strokes. I guarantee you that that, that, that model, that railgun, probably was painted and weathered in less than a day. It would have yeah. been done so quickly, and if you look at a lot of the a, a lot of the parts that were in the Paris gun um, diorama as well, you look at the way that the objects are, are painted in that. They're painted with such almost carefree free abandon. It's it, it just sort of makes you smile, and you think, yeah, you, that's somebody who's who's gone at that so quickly. He's not even thinking about what he what he's doing, and you can tell if you look at the the photographs of this diorama in particular. You look at the figures and, and that kind of thing. There's no there's no particular elegance to it, and yet and yet the finished diorama is absolutely superb from start to finish. It's completely sublime, and I. I, I I can, honestly cannot tell you how many times I've looked at this thing and just gone, mm. yeah, love that bit, love that bit. I love the way that that, that works. I love the balance of it. It's, I, I would have, I would, I don't know how much I, I'd be prepared to pay to own this diorama because it is, it, it is literally one of the, yeah. I think one of the, the best things I've ever seen. I love yeah. it. I think like, I think like Shep Payne and like Francois Verlinden did. And, and, and unlike, <laughs> unlike what amateur hour here in amateur hour from Dudley here was doing is that the, when they were doing a lot of their figures for their diorama works, they, a lot of the time they weren't going down that painterly route that figure painters do. They were going down an expedient route of washes, dry brushing, bang, that's it. Next figure washes, dry brushing, which I've had to remind myself recently that ah, that technique works. Mm. It works. And, and as much as we all want to master new skills and we all want to, paint things for want of a better phrase properly and I, I use that in a very loose sense but you know to follow a proper method a proper technique and as you say Lewis and uh, Shep and Francois were having to do dioramas so they had to manage their time so efficiently <coughs> they were going for effect rather than technique and if and if they could go for an effect that bypassed a whole load of technique they do it yeah um, but but again, with this is not this is trust me this is by no means are we seeking to uh, you know kind of belittle or downplay what they did. What we are saying is they were they were such masters at creating illusion. I think this is the thing that we often forget about modelling. It is like you say, it's like Trump Trump Loi. It mm. is it is illusion. It is about yeah. sleight of eye, as I like to call it. And it's it's you look at something and then you look at it again and then you suddenly think that's not what what I'm seeing is not what I'm looking at. I think one of the interesting I think one of the interesting things about about this the, these systems and the way that they they kind of worked it is I read a, a, a I read yesterday I think that that the Beatles released something like six albums in thirty four months. Yeah, um, um, which is by any stretch of the imagination is extraordinary and you know and as a result of that they release some of the greatest music ever ever listened to um and that's and the reason why they did that was because they had so many ideas they just want to get in the studio and just get it out there and, and do all of that kind of thing and i think that's the same with a lot of these very um, prolific model makers is that they have so many things that they want to build they almost feel a, a deep sense of resistance to the idea of spending more time than they need to on 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 sort of micromanaging the project and to them, it's much better. I, I feel the same way. I, I think I've got to that, you know, you get to that point where it's like, well, I'm 53 now. How long are these going to work? And so what I kind of think then is I don't really want to be spending five years building a model when I can build 50 models in that same time. Because there's a lot of things out there I'd like to do. I don't really want to concentrate only on one large project for X amount of time. So I've sort of found ways around that except for yesterday, which was cataclysmically terrible in my workshop. Um, so, 
you know, and I've kind of found ways around those sort of things. And I think that was the same with Lewis. I think it's the same with with guys like Bob Letterman as well. And there, uh, and Shep, Shep Payne was had to do it because he was paid to do, to to work at that. As far as I'm aware, Lewis wasn't building for anybody else. He certainly wasn't building professionally at this point he, these were models for himself but i think he had so many ideas it was like no i've got to get this down i've got to i've got to sketch this idea out and rather than him sketching out on in two dimensions he was just gluing stuff together and then at the end of it he got a model you know you look at that uh, you look at axis lenlies and you look at that that rail that railway gun and everything i mean that's that's a model that was built you know really quickly for him and you look at the detail on it, and th there's no kind of like in all of the structures around the around the the, the railway station. There's no bolt heads or anything like that. Why? Because he didn't really need to put them on there to get the point across. And also, by doing that, he would have slowed himself down and wouldn't have been able to build another diorama mm. almost immediately afterwards. That's. I think it's about about getting ideas out, and and I, I think it's it. it it's one of those sort of, I guess it's, it's, it's those kind of projects that we have. These days, model making is very sophisticated. I, I've, I've, I've recently written about this. It, I think it's become, it's become almost too sophisticated in many ways. And those days of being able to create things really quickly are difficult to find. Uh, we, we're not able to, you, you and I both, both know this, you know. And if, the problem these days is we are, we are all modeling to a certain degree in high definition. Yes. And we're all we're always conscious that everything we're doing, especially when we're sharing it on websites and social media and and whatnot, is you know something something that I, something I could sit here and paint and I can look at it from a normal viewing distance. And I think, yeah, that looks fine. I'm more than happy with that. I got to take a photograph with my iPhone. I put it up on the iMac screen here, and I'm just like, yeah, really, you know. It's... And that's and that's because those pieces should never be seen that big. Yep. You're not building something in quarter scale. Yeah. You know, you're building something that's the size of a pea. And I think we've become our kind of own worst critics in all of that. Sometimes I'll I'll do the same thing with figures. I'll paint them and then I'll photograph and enlarge them up to see to see how they look. And I'm horrified by the by by the, the process. But that's not the point. And and I'm yeah. I'm also very uh, uh, these days, if I'm designing one of my books and I put photographs on the page. I'm almost, um, I'm almost sort of overly sensitive about making those pictures bigger than they are in reality, mm. because because if you you know enlarge up a seventy second scale engine, for instance, and you enlarge it up to this size, that's you're going to show everything unless you're a genius, um, and I'm not. Have it the way that it would look in reality. You can still see it on the page. So I do think we have got to that point, and and I'm so pleased with. Uh, that we that we came through a period with these guys of of being able to see these dioramas and see them built with the speed and the and the tenacity of uh, of of these guys and also I think it needs to be I think Coventry City have just scored against Cardiff I can hear Liz I can hear her uh, screaming in the back that's uh, just check so uh, you carry on I'm just yeah. checking the football so, scores here. The other thing is, uh, as well, is I'm pretty sure that that must be what's happened unless somebody's been sent off. She's still cheering. Isn't it fabulous? Mighty Sky Blues. Um, so, yes. So, is it 1-0? Yes. Yeah, good girl. Good boys. Um, so, one of the things about Lewis as well is was he's completely fearless. I, I don't think I, I, there's there's a, another model maker out there that was quite as fearless. He quite liked the idea of building a uh, an aircraft iron, and he particularly liked the idea of building a B fifty two. And somebody said to him, "Oh, you can get a B fifty two model. You know, you can get a seventy second scale B fifty two, and you know, nah, it's just not big enough." And they said, "Well, you know, what about doing it in forty eighth? And he said, "Nah, it's still not big enough." So he built one in thirty second scale for a diorama. A 30-second scale B-52 that he scratch built, and he took it to, I think he took it to the US Nationals. It, it appeared over there, and it was part and parcel of a diorama. It's actually on a base. I think it might even be surrounded by bomb trucks as well, loading it, uh, loading it all up. Can you imagine the thought process of sitting down one day and going, you know, I quite fancy building a B-52, but I don't think I'm going to use a kit. I think I'm going to scratch build it in 30 seconds. I wouldn't even know where to begin. I remember seeing that model in Fine Scale Modeler, 
I found a picture of it online, but it's so small, it's just not worth putting the uh, putting the picture up tonight. But it's there's Lewis in uh, in his kind of like his his sneakers and his uh, and you know his, in his jeans and his open neck shirt, and he's standing next to it. And the mo the wingspan of the model is as tall as he was. And he wasn't a short guy. He's a <laughs> no, you know, he was six foot. Guy. He's and, only six foot. And it just and it's just the look on his face of just kind of like uh, kind of like I built this. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's, and it's he, he the, there is a video that we placed where well, there's a video that we put up on the on the page which was a, a documentary series uh, made in the states which one episode 30 minutes long about lewis made about five years ago and even though at that stage i think he said that he he kind of like retired from modeling just his enthusiasm mm. and the joy and the glee and you know, you, you people say that, you know, people's faces are an open book. This is a guy who just loved talking about model making. He loved it. He, yeah, yeah. you know, and like I say, you, you, when you're talking, I'll see if I can go online and find that picture of that B-52. Like I say, it's not great quality, no. but it's it an just, extraordinary it just, piece of work though. So, yeah. I mean, I'll see if I can just, find it because we're talking yeah. about it. So let's see and, if I can find and, it. And so he would, he would think nothing of doing that, literally nothing no. of doing that. And, I remember seeing again. I remember seeing that photograph for the first time. I think, oh, look at that. And it, 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 apart from anything else, it's the sheer amount of material that you need to build something along along those lines, and the plans that would be needed and, and, and drawn up. But he wasn't interested on that model, as far as I can, uh, as far as I'm aware, he wasn't interested in it being a perfect scale model of a B fifty two, as long as it captured closely the essence of the of the real aeroplane but when you saw it I, I would imagine for those people who were lucky enough to see it in the flesh and i'm pretty sure he took it to the u.s nationals for those people who, who sort of looked at it and went it must have been it must have been absolutely eye-watering just to to see something like that in the flesh and i think we saw um was it a 48 scale peacemaker that was at national championships was it 48 that HPH kit, uh, yeah. I mean, that was huge as well, wasn't it? And we've seen 48 scale um, and B-52s, but a 30 second scale one's just I've just found the pictures. So these are from the these are from the collection. I think these are from the collection of Bob Letterman. So in uh, you know in advance to Bob Letterman, we do acknowledge these are his pictures, and uh, you know we are using them uh, for illustrative purposes and also just to, to celebrate the. Uh, you know the life and the work of Louis Pruno, so I hope he does understand. We are borrowing I'm sure these. He, off I'm from. sure he will. Yeah, but yeah, that's there the big thing. There you go. Um, but and this, this is uh, that's just <laughs> <laughs> it's just wow. And like I say, it just sums up the man. Is that, it, that he's there with his kind of like basketball sneakers and with the tongues hanging out, and the, there's that model and everything. And it's the, the, there's no. There's no kind of how can I describe it? it he's just like, yeah, I built this. Uh, <laughs> next, next project. Uh, there's no resting on his laurels. It's like, yeah, I built a 30 second scale P52. Now I'm going to build something else. Man was just a machine. He really I, was, was. I mean, today I was looking at a, a, a little um, little Slingsby Cadet glider and thinking, oh. I quite fancy building one of those in 48. Quite a tiny little thing, scratch building it. And then I thought, oh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that. And then. And then this comes along, and you, bum, and you bum, bum. I know. Just look at it; it's extraordinary. And you know what a what a privilege that 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 we got to see somebody that was able to to create stuff like that. I mean, I think it's. I'm sure there are people out there going, "Well, yeah, but film studios create that sort of stuff all the time and everything." You've got yeah, to I mean, remember, film, this film studios have got this exactly, and also so you've got, got themes, to, and they've got time sometimes Ex exactly and, and and also they've got trained model makers Lewis wasn't a trained model maker he was like the rest of us he was a hobby a hobbyist he was just somebody that loved sticking bits of plastic together and creating masterpieces it's it's sort of as it's sort of as fairly simple as that really it was just kind of his approach and and certainly if if you get a chance it when when you've when we've finished doing this just go online and and, and google his his work a lot of his work appeared it appeared in fine scale modeler it appeared in in the showcases this one uh volume six if you've got this one this is the one that's got 
Constanz railway um, station diorama. Uh, this one here. So you can kind of um, see it. And now. also, of course, super diorama, super which I've just gone onto Amazon. And rather shamefacedly, I don't have a copy of this. I do now because it's winging its way to me. But I'm, I'm going to say to people out there, if you want to get a copy of this book, I did notice today they started shooting up in price. So, um, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, get, get in there early. But yeah, I've, I've, do you know what? This, I've got all the Shep Payne books. I suddenly realized I've got all the Belinda ones. I suddenly realized this is probably one of the few iconic modeling books I mm. don't have. Yes, but I will now. It's on its way to me. I think I got this for. I think I paid about just about twenty five quid for this. Do you know what? That's twenty five quid. Of, that's twenty five quid's worth of money well spent because this is just constant inspiration. This yeah. is, and and also, yeah. I think having gone through a period recently where I have been trying to build and paint things, especially figures to twenty 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 one sensibilities. Do you know what? I think the next chance I get to build some figures, I am going right back. I'm going back to my instincts as a teenager, as a as a young person back in my early 20s. I'm going to go back to painting one how I used to paint them, which is not to get worried about technique. Just just go for effect. Mm, just paint it. Put it. Just paint it. Know, put yeah, paint don't on overthink it. it. And that's the problem. I think it's the problem we all have these days is we do overthink these things to the yes. point that I think we've both had this week. We've, we've finally reached the paint booth and we've just gone, what am I doing? I, yeah, in, in, indeed. Changing the subject slightly, I, I think that's kind of it, it's an important. <laughs> it's been an important life lesson this week. Really, I, I wrote about it yesterday on my blog, mm. uh, and I wrote a, a stream of consciousness uh, that took me twenty minutes to write the thick end of a thousand words. I just had to get it out. Uh, all about the being in the workshop yesterday, and 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 how sort of badly a paint job sort of went south really um and and how we can second guess ourselves a, a lot of the time i think that's part of the, the thing i think it's important and i hope you agree with this i think it's important that that we're honest about what we do social media is 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 a is can be a great thing for sharing um, your your life with people, but often it's sugar coated, and often it's polished up um, so that people try and prove that somehow their life is perhaps better than it is. Their skills are perhaps better than they are. Their work is perhaps better, and they don't make mistakes. And I think that that's a really bad road to go down. And so I'm always really open if something yeah. goes wrong. And yesterday. It went sideways so quickly, and it, it, to the point where this morning I had to phone up Brett and say, "I'm sorry, Brett, but this model isn't going to be finished. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm cutting it loose because I, I wasn't satisfied with it. I was I was chasing it, I was fighting it all the way, and so I, I and so I had to have a very sort of you know I, I guess uh, important conversation with him, apologize and say, look, for the first time in a long time, this project isn't going to be finished that, and I'm not going to hit your deadline. It's as simple as that. But it was an awful mess. It was a terrible mess. Well, I think, uh, it's, I think it's an important thing. And I think this is something that I've probably, um, I've probably touched upon in, uh, <laughs> touched upon in what was formerly your magazine, which is now Brett's magazine, yeah. which is that, you get people coming into this hobby now they're seeing they're seeing perfect models all the time they're seeing they're seeing the work of you know the great models we have these days like Miguel Jimenez like Martin Kovac like Adam Wilder uh, David Parker um what you I could just go on and on and on listing all these names and whatever yeah what they tend not to see are the projects that didn't work out the projects yeah. where they just went Ah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I can't do anything with this. I have, and, and it just ends up getting binned. I mean, Martin's quite open about it on his video on his uh, night shift channel because he said this is something that I built and I wasn't happy with it. I'm coming back to it again. But yeah, what you never see are the projects where failure turned up and failure <laughs> failure turned up in a grand scale, if you pardon the pun. Yeah. And People, people need to understand that, that if you're working on a project, and I've seen it happen this week with with new beginners or inexperienced modelers who've been building things, and they're getting frustrated because things have gone wrong. Yeah, join the club. It happens to everybody. Mm. Don't be disillusioned by it because 
like a lot like, like like a lot of us sometimes things go wrong and you just have to take a step back and, and then eventually you go actually i know why that went wrong now the one thing so, that i've i've sort of learned over the years is is to know when to stop Mm. And <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> yeah, to, to know when to stop and to know when a project is is not going to happen for me. And when I get to that point in any project, I don't have a shelf of doom in inverted commas. I don't have a. I don't put anything back in the box. If I've got to that point in a project where I know that it's not going to happen for me, the the project gets put in the box. The box gets put in the bin, and I won't finish it. Because if I've already compromised my initial plans for it and I've already compromised my initial sort of set of techniques and I'm already chasing my tail, no amount of work on that model is ever going to make it better. It's never going to make it something that I'm mm. happy with. So I will throw it out. It will go out. Um, occasionally, I'll strip a model down if I'm working for a project that's got to go for the magazine. I, I mean, in, in the case of this model, I could have. You know, I could have stripped it and, and perhaps reworked it, but I was so tight to the deadline anyway. And and frankly, I got to the point where I really didn't like anything about it, uh, and and I'd, I'd stopped enjoying the the the, the process. I'd, I'd stopped having fun with it, and I thought the best thing to do with this is is to let it go and then move on to something else. And so that's what I'm kind of planning on on, on doing. And I I. I get the counter argument, you know, kits are expensive and all of that sort of stuff. I paid for this kit as well. It wasn't a sample. I, I actually bought it. Um, so so I was happy to kind of, not happy, but I was I, I was okay with, with, with letting it go. But I, yeah. I, it's it's about being your own, uh, I think, it, your own critic and your own arbiter of what's good and what's bad. And mm. and and unfortunately, you and I both work in, in the glare of the spotlight, um, don't we? Um, which sounds like a, a lyric from yeah, Incubus. Um, I was going to say, Incubus, yeah. Marillion from the Amazon yes. Garden. Um, you, got of, you got your copy of uh, uh, Classic Frog Magazine yet? No, I haven't. No, I should, I'm I should get, get hold of I, I think I, I'd like to get Fugazi as well, the new remaster. Um, mm. Yes, so, um, yeah, as uh, celluloid puppets and all of that sort of stuff. All right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think because we tend to, I, I work in that, in that arena it, it it's i think that adds its own kind of pressure but yesterday i didn't like it this morning didn't get any better i tried working on it didn't get any better now you see on the other hand being a being uh what many friends describe me as uh you jm are a classic torian and I say to them, uh, star signs, that's all nonsense. But then being a Turian, I'm naturally skeptical. Um, <laughs> is, that, um, is that I'm just like, this model will not beat me. These figures will not, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, honestly, I mean, value for money, those figures, I, I've certainly got me <laughs> hypothetical money's worth out of them. It's like it's like you've actually painted nine figures. It but feels I like I've painted an entire infantry. But I I tend to be kind of like, you know, Curse you, model! You won't get away from me. And there we go. We got. We're just. Um, we're just before we round off tonight. We've got a couple more of uh, Lewis's uh, models we'll talk about, and that is there's that one. This is uh, yeah. This is the um, a section of the U five hundred five diorama yeah. that, we, that we showed earlier on, and you yeah. can kind of see how these are converted um, Vlinden figures on there, mm -hmm. as you can see. But you can see how uh, this is a really good photograph to show you how he's gone about creating details that make you think this is more complex than it is take a look at the gun mounts mm. on that and take a look at how those were created those are the 20 mil guns from a flat veiling and he's just mm -hmm. basically glued them together added a few little details around and put them on a plinth and there you go i i don't suppose for a single second that those gun mounts look like they like the real ones but you look at the dark you look at that in the rounds and you're not taken by the gun mounts you're taken by the figures you're taken by the conning tower and you're taken by the foaming water around it. You're looking at it as a as a, a, a bigger section. You're not looking at, at the tiny details. And that's where his genius was. I mean, that's a great picture of a great model, isn't it? I mean, it's just... It's well, just do you know what? I'm actually, I'm actually zooming in to the... Um, I'm zooming into the image as far as I can, can here. And as far as I can tell... I don't think he even hollowed the uh, the gun barrels out. I think he just painted them black. I'm sure he did. He just did I'm it. Sure. 
Yes. Yes. And I think I think another one, he as you say, he didn't do he didn't do that many aircraft dioramas. So this is another one from the Valinden Way six. Um, and this is a, it was a diorama of a Fockel 190D that's crashed. And I think I, I seem to remember the caption in the book that, that Francois Valinden wrote was Lewis found a photo, brackets, lucky old Lewis is always finding photos. And he was actually inspired to create a a hay rack of all things mm. before then going on to uh, do the model. Now, the thing that's always struck me about this this is the this is the old Ravel. I think this I think this is yeah this is the Ravel thirty second scale D nine because the Hasegawa didn't do a D nine until the late eighties when they did a, a re reworking of their A kit. So this is this has to be the old Ravel kit. He hasn't rescribed it. It's it's all raised panel lines and raised rivets. He's done a some. I, again, I don't want to say rudimentary because that sounds like me being dismissive. But he's opened up a few panels. He's done a shet pane. He's put in stuff that looks right, even yeah. if it may not necessarily right. He's put kind of greebles and greeblies in there and whatever. Um, and the rest of it is just again, your mind is filling in the blanks. It, it's this is an uh, to me this is one of his most iconic dioramas. Mm. But as you say, it's what 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 you're what you're seeing and what it is sometimes are actually two different things. A lot yeah. of that surface detail um, is where he's actually dry brushed and picked up the the raised rivets on on that on that kit. I'm sure it is the Ravel kit in thirty second scale. He's also mixed thirty second scale and thirty fifth scale. So purists, please look away now. <laughs> but again, it is it is that thing that you're, you're thinking that looks. That looks really super detailed. If you were to say to an aircraft modeler, oh, I'm just going to dry brush raised panel lines and raised rivets, they'd probably have kittens. Well, I'm about to do exactly that because uh, Mike Reeves uh, of this of this parish has sent me two monogram kits that I've wanted, uh, the mm -hmm. Sky Raider and the A4 Skyhawk, which I've mm -hmm. just bought. Um, oh, for the Sky Raider, I bought that new Caracal decal sheet. Da, da, da. Oh, it's pretty. Um, so, and at the risk of... of, of of causing brickbacks to come my way, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking of doing the the uh, bumblebee one. That's that's actually from the monogram kit. You know the uh, with the that everybody hates and everybody says you should never do a Sky Raider in that color scheme. But I kind of think it's iconic on that monogram kit because that was um, what it was. Surprising. Also, it uh, that was one that was featured in on plastic wings. It it indeed, indeed. I'd forgotten all about that. No, um, think, so think... yes. I think you need to follow. I, th I think, I think, young, young, young Obi Spence, you need to follow the force. I, I, I do indeed. So yeah, so I'm sort of feelings. thinking, thinking about doing that just to see how those two models look with raised panel lines on them and all of that sort of stuff. I appreciate people are going to go, no, no, Spence, you should why, get the, why, get, why get, get the Tamiya that? kit and buy the Hasegawa. No, just go out and buy the Tamiya kit. You know, it's just it's far better. You know. No, so yes, I'd forgotten about that. It's in, in on plastic wings, isn't it? Well, I think that's it. I think that's uh, your destiny. Your destiny. I'm going to go out and this all night, all night now. That's your yeah, destiny, it, it, indeed. Um, but yeah, David Mummery has put there. It's like impressionist uh, modeling. It is. It, yep. That's the that's the, the the whole kind of essence of. Yep. That's uh, what I meant uh, earlier on. All of this. I said that. Yeah, yeah. it, it yeah. very much is like that, and. And models and dioramas that should be seen in the right. It's interesting that, that this has kind of come out t um, today that a number of people, and I've been sort of keeping up with the, with the comments that I'm here, have, uh, have never heard of this guy until, until um, today. And I, I think uh, I, I think Sir, Sir Drew of Manton uh, mentioned this in, in, in our chat that, that he, I think he was sort of aware of him. But, but maybe not so much. And I wonder whether or not it's because Lewis wasn't an aircraft model. I wonder whether that was the kind of thing. And, and that if, you, if you'd sort of followed, if you'd followed Francois's work, you were, you were going to get caught up with Lewis's work and you were going to get caught up with Bob Letterman's work because th their stuff was going was to appear in, in, in those books. Uh, I wonder whether that, that was the case. And, and certainly Lewis isn't as well known in the UK, as as other modelers, I, I don't think. But I, I, in no way does that does that um, does that reduce his his no. kind of impact on, no. on the hobby. And, and, and I think I, I said this right at the beginning. But Louis Prono's work and what he offered 
to the modeling world, certainly within that first 20 years of, uh, of, of hitting the scene, I think is incalculable, actually, in terms of diorama building. I, I think he will go down in the history of this hobby as one of the greatest diorama builders the world has ever seen and will yeah. ever see. Uh, yeah. I think that I don't, I'm not over egging that. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of where we are with him. Bob Letterman in the same bracket. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I actually, I, I actually think ironically, even though we are now in an era of the, of the super kits in terms of how many things are coming out now in, in whopping great big scales, um, you know, 30 second scale Lancaster, for example, I, I, I think that the era of the super diorama of the type that Bob Letterman and Lewis Pruno did. I think that's over. I'm not over, but I think, I think you had the perfect combination there of two modelers, the, the means to uh, promote and uh, promote the diorama's they were doing, which was through Verlinda Letterman and stock, um, you know, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. I just think these days to, to suddenly get that, perfect combination a bit like a band to suddenly have that perfect mm. combination of people and place and zeitgeist and everything i i i think you you will still you will still see people doing largest dioramas but i i hope people prove me wrong but mm. i think that era of people who went out to went out and all they built was the super diorama they just built these monumental epic widescreen models i think that's i think that's perhaps an era uh, yeah and an era where if you wanted to build them you had to scratch build them mm. i think that a lot of that's gone now um, yeah i mean there are there's certainly there are people still out there doing that um mm. uh, phil Stuchin, phil stachinskis has mm. been doing some big dioramas as well. And I think he's still at some point planning um, a huge railway diorama that he's been working on for, for some time. So an old rolling stock and all that kind of stuff. Um, certainly, yeah, I think it takes it takes a, a degree of of kind of tenacity. I used that word mm. word earlier on. I, I, I pulled out last year um, the Italeri Vospa, a motor torpedo boat and I put it on my desk and said I'm going to do something around this and in fact I spoke to to my good friend Ian McGonagall about this and and said that this is what I was going to do and build like a wharf side and, and and all of those kind of things and I'm still planning on on doing that but that would have to be done along these lines it couldn't be done and built and painted and micro painted the way that I would do something much smaller. It would have yeah. to be done in a much broader stroke. Otherwise, it'd never get done. And I couldn't, mm -hmm. I, I can't justify planning a project that's going to take me a year to put together. Yeah. I'm not interested um, in it apart from anything else. Yeah. Pavel, Kup pa Pavel Krupovich makes a very good point here. He says these dioramas are very much like ILM props for Star Wars. They look great when you see them moving on a large screen, but close up, they sometimes reveal how simplified they are, but that's not how they were meant to be watched. Absolutely spot on, Pavel. That is, mm, yeah, that it is, is precisely it. I mean, yeah, it's 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 one of those things that when you know when you've when I've seen kind of like close ups of film props, or you know, sometimes I've actually seen them in the flesh. Apart from with ILM, it's how many times R two D two figures end up on models here, there, and everywhere. Is yeah, you're you know we 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 these days we tend to freeze frame and view everything in high definition whereas actually originally they're only meant to be seen fleeting across the cinema screen in a fraction of a second this is you know to yeah. kind of go off slightly on a tangent again this is the thing that's massively impressed me a few years ago when i ended up getting uh, space 1999 on blu-ray to watch on my honking great big new television screen was this was a show that was made beyond the realms of tiny little color televisions or black and white televisions in the 70s. Mm. The amount of care and attention to detail that went into everything on that show, from the models to the mm. sets to the props and everything, it's, it's cinema quality. And yet yeah. it was beyond what would have been appreciated on on a television screen. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, th I think I think we, you, you know, you you could. You could spend, you could, you know, take one of one of Lewis's big models, or even Bob Letterman's, or even some of Francois' stuff, and you could sit there and you could go, "Isn't that fantastic? I've I've exquisitely chipped and painted and weathered this rusty bucket," and it's like fantastic. You still got the rest of the diorama to do. 
Yeah, you know, exactly. You well, think there has to be a certain amount of craft that goes into it, whereby you go, is it creating the impression I'm, I'm looking for? Yeah, right, bang, move on to the next one. And, I mean, and Pavel, in many respects, that is, that is actually an incredible skill to master. It is. And Pavel makes a really good point about that. Um, I, I was at uh, the Uzvar Hazy Center, uh, Smithsonian, in, uh, in Washington. I only there for a couple of hours, but just as uh, part of a layover when I was last in the States. And in there, they've got in a glass display case, they've got the mothership um, miniature from Close Encounters. Um, it's got to be one of the worst models I've ever seen in my life. It's absolutely terrible from start it's to finish. It's very small as well, isn't it? It, it? Yeah, it's not very big, but it is so rough. You yeah. look at it and you go, that is just awful. And then you realise how long it's on the screen and it's in darkness and you don't see any of that detail. Um, so you can see what it was made for. But if you look at, um, there's a um, uh, there's a, a Star Wars book that came out recently. I think it's called Sculpting the Galaxy. Uh, it's yeah. a coffee table book. It's brilliant. Um, and I was looking, flicking through that, and, you, and there's lots of close-ups of, of the models from Star Wars in there and the painting and all of that kind of stuff. Terrible in places. Really rough. But mm -hmm. then they were building X-Wings for, you know, in in a day or so to get them onto the screen. Um, Martin, uh, Martin Bauer tells the story of how he was asked to build a refinery model for oh, Alien. Yeah. They built the big one. Oh, Alien, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for Alien. Built the big one. They built an intermediate one, but they needed a little tiny one for, for a distant shot. Yeah. And I, I think Ridley Scott came in and said, we need one of these models. Can you build one? Had two hours to build the refinery model. And this, and and he just sat there and just quickly put it all together and have sprayed it and handed it over and and that was what was in there. There was no, there was no sort of idea that it was going to be, look anything decent on the screen. We forget the, the that only, some things the, are done for a reason. Yeah, the only, the only, I know we've, we've drifted off again. That's a surprise. Um, the only model I've ever come across, and this is purely from photographs, but it's from people who've who've seen the real thing. The only model I've ever uh, uh, come across which looked as good in the flesh as it did on the screen for the simple reason that a periscope camera was literally a couple of centimeters away from it uh was the uh reefer enterprise from star trek the motion picture mm. because the the guy who did that aztec paint scheme on it and it is a layered series of pearlescent paints which give you this fabulous surface texture uh and the i the, the point there was that that model wasn't weathered it didn't have greeblies to add detail. It, it the paint finish gave this impression of scale, and mm. that that periscope camera was going. It was a big model. It's about I think it was about six foot long, but that camera was still going up to it in ridiculously close quarters. That everything had to be perfect on that model. The finish had to be perfect beyond what was needed for the film. Well, it was needed for the film because of the closeness of the camera. Mm. But there was no shortcuts on that, and yeah. people I know who've seen it, and it's you know they've they've seen the 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 model as it survived down the years, have said that that finish was just, you know, prize winning. It yeah. took it took weeks and weeks to get that finish correct. Uh, yeah. But we, we've gone off on a on a tangent there. But um, Chris, um, Chris Allen uh, has posted there saying um, yeah. that he'd vi visited. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen it. Obviously, I've seen a lot of Francois work. I own a lot, uh, quite a bit of it. Um, and he, he, his attitude was very much that these these models had to be photographed for books yeah. and magazines. And one of the things that 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 I found over the years is that my a lot of my work is really subtle when you look at it. John's seen a lot of my work, so he'll attest to it. Shackleton's when, mostly. Yeah, mostly. But when you see it in the flesh, it, it actually is – it sort of layers of weathering don't stand out from distance. You have to get close to them, mm. which works for my eye when I'm looking at the model. It's on my desk. It doesn't work for photographs. No. And a lot, of the, a lot of model makers over the years have upped the contrast of their own work. I remember, uh, I think his name was Brian Wells, who was a, an armour modeller around the time that Tony Greenland was, was coming, to, um, coming to sort of um, prominence. And I think Brian was a, um, he was a, a, an Irish guy and he scratch built German armour. And I remember asking him about that because his models were very contrasty. And he said, I need them to look that way 
on the page. He says, and when I photographed it and they've printed it, everything gets flattened completely. He says, and those effects will not show up unless I over accentuate them. He said, that's why they look like that. They're not to be looked at mm. in the flesh. They're to work on the page. They're there to work at, uh, under images. Film, and film models, film models work on exactly the same principle. It's that everything has to be turned up to eleven in or, in order to look like seven on the screen. It's yes, yeah. You know, you yeah. look at you look at how you know how flat work can look when you're when you're looking at it on a page. It's you know sometimes you need to kind of over embellish that. And Francois was right. He often said that to me. He, he, what Chris has said, that he said the same thing yeah. to me. He said I'm not I'm not um, I'm not selling models. I'm selling you know I'm selling accessories. I want people to look at it and go, yeah, that works for me. And that's mm. how. But also it was it was very much about style, and that was the same thing with Lewis. You could see Lewis's work if you, if you walked into a room, you'd be able to tell one of Lewis's dioramas without ever being told it was made by him. Mm. You'd be you'd go, yeah, that's made by him. It, it, there's, it, it, there's a very similar there's a very similar technique in uh, music and in music music production, um, which actually uh, which actually manifested itself twenty odd years ago in a horrible way with the Rush album Vapor Trails, which is to do with compression. Mm -hmm. And compression is very good because compression adds a certain amount of dynamacy to the sound and it suddenly makes things spark and it makes certain regions kind of like, you know, it, it adds drama and it, it adds kind of oomph to it. But the problem is sometimes it can absolutely ruin a master recording. Mm -hmm. And I know through messing around with music software that I, I can take things that I record and as soon as I start messing around with compression, I think that's great. As soon as I go back to the actual master recording, it's almost ruined because it's 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 kind of like it's put such a heavy wash in and mm. such a heavy dry brush that that's it it's gone you've lost yeah. it um which yeah. is why you always make duplicates but um yeah but yeah it's kind it's, of weird it's, though isn't it that that dry brushing idea is weird and i think maybe at some point in the future we'll uh, we may come back to this and i'll i'll sort of suggest this as a, a topic of conversation if you i think we may have touched on this last year if you i, I follow a lot a huge number of of artists on Instagram and on mm. Twitter who paint Games Workshop figures mm. and uh, Forge World figures, and I love the style of what they do. Everything is massively over accentuated, and yet when I look at it, I go, "God, that looks great! That looks fantastic!" Could you get away with that with a piece of armor? Absolutely not. Because your mind instinctively says this is fantasy, instinctively mm. says. And yet today, when I was painting the interior of a uh, model that I'm working on at the moment, I used some of those those highlighting ideas from Games Workshop and looked at it and thought, oh, that was pretty good. That looks okay. Will I use it on the rest of the vehicle on the outside of it? Probably not. But inside, where I needed that accentuation. So I think that that's an important that's an important technique and an important idea that modelers should hold on to. Sometimes you need to overly boost something. It's why it's why modelers don't paint the interiors of black cockpits black. Paint them in dark grey yeah. because the the shadow at, will then bring everything down yeah. to the level it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, a master makes a good point. It says a masterclass in dry brushing for the November Festival of Modeling Guys. You know what? I'm actually, I actually am thinking that at some stage with a couple of projects here, I am, I am, I am going to leave the 21st century behind, and I'm literally just going to go uh, wash, dry brush, finished. That's it. You know, therein not, lies madness. You don't want to be doing madness. that. I would never build models yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, Lars Jensen says, a most interesting conversation. Thank you for bringing light on art of creating a perfect illusion that catches our imagination. Well, uh, I, I, honestly, Lewis takes all the credit for that because he was just the master. He was just a master, a genius. And, you know, without lapsing into cliches, this hobby is infinitely poorer that he's no longer around. In um, fact, if you were ever to write a book about Lewis Prono, a perfect illusion would be a fabulous title. Yeah. A perfect illusion that captures everything that you need to know about him. Uh, yeah. I think that that's absolutely the the, the title for that. Right. Uh, before we go, then, um, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping here, and uh, this is it. This this is the moment I absolutely I commit. I commit. Uh, unfortunately, there won't be an interesting modelling show on Sunday, um, and that's for very good reason because. Oh, here it goes. He's diving off the deep end here. 
I should be coming back from We Have Ways Fest uh, because I should be there on the Saturday and the Sunday uh, doing some modelling demos. Now, I know I said we're not going to do Telford. Um, I have been assured that this will be uh, as safe as it possibly can be. And also with the proviso that if I'm not entirely comfortable, I, I can kind of like don't have to do it. So on that on that proviso, that's fine. Uh, so I should be doing some demos on the Saturday and the Sunday. So we should be traveling back from um, from the Milton Keynes area on the Sunday. So unfortunately, there won't be a live show on the Sunday evening, but there might be some little live nuggets coming from We Have Ways Fest. Can I also say, if people didn't catch my Twitter feed, that a large collection of my work is going to be there. Exactly. Uh, I, can't, I, I can't make the show because I'm, I'm otherwise engaged um, mainly with work at the moment, um, which is um, I'm, I'm commissioned and I'm, I'm finding no time to do anything. Um, so, But a lot of the models that were part of the legacy collection from last year, um, including... Uh, two of the models that were built for John and I's challenge, uh, the C34 and the Pink Panther, are both going to be there. So, But there's going to be a lot of dioramas. Uh, Andy Farmer from the hobby company has taken uh, a large collection. I think there's, I don't know, 10 dioramas or something that are, that are, that are going down there. So if you are going to that event, uh, not only will you be able to um, see and speak to John, which would be brilliant, uh, you'll be able to see a, a, a big display of my work on the hobby company stand. So go over, speak to John, speak to Andy, give him some love. Um, you know, yeah, from a distance, a obviously. Break. Yeah, no, go up to John and give him a big, massive hug. Yes, trust me, that was... <laughs> trust me, the sound you can probably hear at the moment is the butterflies in my stomach that are... Um... <laughs> are now churning over massively because i have committed to doing it but it's yes. it, it's like i say we've we've gone through the logistics i've seen where we're going to be doing the demos and everything and it's like you know and it's and it's the, the event is going to be as biosecure as it can be and so i thought it's got to be done i can't you know I've, I've given up telford this is probably as safe as it's going to be so we're going to do it um so there's no no live show on Sunday, unfortunately. But like I say, there might be little live nuggets coming. It'll be like Soylent there. Green. Oh, don't. Plus, I'm, I haven't really had anything to eat today. I am. Um, I've had two rounds of cake, but that was that was because I was in your neck of the woods, Wales. So um. <laughs> oh yes, I saw that by the yeah. by the Wales Lighthouse from uh, East Usk Lighthouse. I went to RSPB Newport Wetlands and had cake cake at Goldcliff and cake. At Welsh Cakes, obviously, at uh, RSPB. So anyway, long story short, no show on Sunday, but blah, 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 blah. Anyway. I, noticed, I noticed that you couldn't resist the idea of saying, in your neck of the woods. It's it's payback for... Well, actually, that's the weird thing, because because it that's a, that's a pun that works on two levels. Because one, you were born in that there Wales. In that um, there Wales, yeah, indeed. But also, I was in Newport. Indeed. Yeah. Um, maybe we kind of need to extend this because you're not doing a show on Sunday and do what Pavel's just said and just very quickly uh, discuss those two announcements, one from today and one from yesterday. Um, perhaps we ought to just quickly go through that. Um, we've got five, ten minutes. Yeah, we're fine. Um, we're just, fine. just go through that. Yes, there have been two major announcements over the last couple of days, which are, which have hit the uh, hit the the kind of the newsstands. The first one of those was yesterday, and that is that uh, Qatar, Kotara, um, from New Zealand, who are the company that that sprung out of the ashes of Winglet Wings, have announced that their very first kit will be a thirty second scale Spitfire Mark One A, a late version of that i sent a couple of messages to um richard alexander this morning to ask about this kit this kit's due for release he was very loose in the idea sometime next year later on next year but they've they've released some information on this kit um including some um some sort of renders cad renders and it does look really nice from the the images that they've they've put down surface detail on it looks like it's going to kind of follow on 
in some ways, what they were attempting to do with their 30 second scale Lancaster, mm. uh, which we, we saw. I, um, there, there's been much discussion on this, and I noticed that, that the interesting modeling company got involved in, in discussions on this with the oh no, not another Spitfire. You know, that, that was that, done, that that was done uh, with a, a huge dose of irony because. Because, well, let's put it this way. I, that was done with a huge dose of irony because, as I subsequently pointed out in response, that this is, this is a fledgling company that needs to get out there and it needs to have a hit single on its hands first time round. You yes. ain't going to go wrong with a 30-second scale Spitfire Mark One, And like I say, people are going to be, they're going to be, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, Pete, not another, thir- not another Spitfire. No, yeah. no, no. You're, no, this, they, they need to have a hit. And this guarantees... Ka-ching, money because it's yes. a business it's not a service to modelers it's a business no. and the other thing as well is it was then pointed out to them that the last time a 30 second scale mark one spitfire hit the stands was 1967 mm. so there hasn't been a mark one since then we've had mark twos uh, uh revel re- uh, issued their mark two um we've had mark fives um, and that kind of thing um, didn't plus- hasagawa in the late 80s we did one of their limited repops of their Mark V into a Mark One. It's possible, possible, it's possible. but that, 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 not that, sure that's about not that. The point is, is there has been a chasm, yeah, between a, a, you know a decent thirty-second scale Battle of Britain era Mark One. I think, yeah. and I think what we're gonna what we're gonna see with with this kit is we're gonna see something akin to um, to a kind of a Tamiya rendering of the the mark one spitfire yeah. um it also they've got um uh, they've got a new zealand air force pilot deers aircraft on the box top as well so obviously they're kind of aiming for their for their their home market the box art looks absolutely wonderful i think it's an aircraft flying over dunkirk isn't it i think um from from what i can remember but yes, that's going to be that's going to be a, a really fabulous. Route. You're going to have to wait another twelve months, I think, before this thing finally sees the light of day. But that's, I think, it's a massive announcement from a brand new company. And like John says, it's literally a no-brainer. You can't. It's almost like do a one hundred and nine, a Spitfire, or a Mustang, and you just go. Thank you. But you see, people people are already queuing up to say, why aren't you doing? What you know, there are lots of other things that have not been kitted. Why aren't you doing? A, a 30 second scale and then it's like i'm like I, what i gotta look that up i've no idea what that is <laughs> somebody s- said why aren't you doing a 30 second scale martin baker mb5 because <laughs> it wouldn't sell and i'm like that would be a lovely 30 second scale kit That'd be nice if you only wanted to sell 13 of them um so how many, yeah how many color schemes can you finish an mb5 in uh one one i think yes. yeah pretty much one it's a pretty airplane it looks, it looks great. Bit limited, I think. Best uh, looking let, Mustang ever built. Yeah, let's do a 30 second scale A9A. Let's do that. Oh, actually, let's do a 30 second scale A9. That would be f- pretty fabulous as well. Although the, that's a, the, the, the thing the, that the A10 beats. Yeah, it, yeah, the thing that looks like a frog yeah. foot. Uh, yeah. Or the frog foot looks like an A9. Um, yeah. And then we have another re- announcement that came out today, didn't we? Um, um, which has been which has been much anticipated. The mystery Tamiya kit. The mystery Tamiya kit. And Tamiya have finally announced their next 35th scale kit will be the glorious M18 Hellcat, which we absolutely adore in these parts. And if the if the reaction to the M18 is anything to go by, uh, Tamiya are going to sell 63 million of these kits in in the first week of sales it it just looks fabulous they've put some uh, quite a lot of photographs of this thing up online so you can kind of see what it looks like and it's got a figure within uh, and everything not a very big vehicle the m18 quite no, I, quite, it's, quite compact yeah. but it's a very important type and as bruce culver um, um said today as well you could also do a slightly different version the prototype i think that's got the different 90 mil turret on it um, mm. from a, an m36 i think my memory serves me um correctly but yeah brilliant that's a just a killer choice of subject yeah. from from to me um so uh, hopefully we will we will be getting uh, early samples of those to 
stick together and paint in olive drab and put loads of stowage on. Fabulous. Yeah, only one figure in them as well, which is genius. That'll that'll get occupied me for six months. Um, the 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 <laughs> yes. thing about the M the M eighteen is I was only two digits out because I was in our in our kind of little uh, chat group thing that we have. Um, mm. I actually predicted that I thought it was actually going to be an M sixteen half track because the their uh, their half tracks have not been around for ages now, no. and I wondered I wondered whether or not perhaps the the tooling has given up the ghost you don't know it's it was one of those things i thought no i think it's going to be a brand new 35th scale um white half track series but eh, m m16 m18 two digits out i think that's pretty good going by my that's, reckoning that's pretty good on the uh, on the model making lottery i think uh, not too uh, bad but i yeah, think it's, yeah, it's a Sorry? really good choice isn't it it's great no choice. fabulous choices and and yeah uh you know yeah, again you know not bad for a dying hobby but there you go yeah and, and we we've already had Two 35th scale injection molded um, kits of the M18. <coughs> one from AFE Club, one from Academy, which is now the, in a, an airfix box. Yeah, box yeah. um, both of which have got dimensional inaccuracies. I've, I've built both of them as well o over the years. Don't know where they never, ended up. Never, but, never built one. Uh, but uh, yeah, really, really nice. Um, so cannot wait to get my hands on. on, I, on I cannot wait. I cannot wait for the first comment that I see, which uh, when somebody hears that Tamir are doing a 35th scale Hellcat, that they'll go, ah, oh, why aren't I doing it in 32nd scale like the rest of our aircraft? <laughs> yes, indeed. And, and I have to say, uh, and I'll put this out there, along with the, uh, with the Comet, um, British Comet, the M18 is, uh, is the best looking um, vehicle of the Second World War. And I include the Ag Panther in that, which would be third. I'm still too terrified from having committed myself to doing this show this weekend to argue, so we'll leave it at that. Maybe that's just because you've not eaten and you've only had cake. No, it's it's honestly, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Um, um, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be perfect. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't seem very, you don't seem overly convinced. As somebody that 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 uh, that at the very first football match of the season at uh, at the uh, Coventry Building Society Arena uh, a couple of weeks ago, had a, a two seat gap between himself and the next person along who wasn't part of our group. When Coventry City scored, he gave me a hug. And kissed me yeah. twice. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I'm overly kind of <laughs> concerned, Bisa, because I just think. <sighs> let's just say, let's just say, we'll end, we'll end this on the end this today with a, a, a little bit of a life lesson. I think as well, as somebody, as somebody who kind of like, quite frankly, has, has has made a lifelong career of of managing anxiety in one form or another, <laughs> um, placing oneself in situations where you are. Uh, having to confront things that that uh, kind of like are the cause of those anxieties. Uh, the going out today, this is the thing that swung it for me in the end. Was um, I drove over with a friend of mine to Newport today, and it was two things, two two stories with, to do with Newport, two stories to do with bridges. First one is I, for the life of me, I could not drive over the Seven Bridge for years because it just threw me completely. Just the 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 height. The just vertigo, everything. I can drive over it as a passenger, can't drive over it in the car. Two years ago, drove over it and bit by bit got used to it. I quite enjoy driving across it now. And the old Seven Bridge, quite enjoy it. So again, something that it, it put a block on me going somewhere. I confronted it. Now I can do it. The second thing was the Transporter Bridge in Newport, which I did a year ago, which is that huge thing mm. you can walk across the top of it on the open gantry, on the open mesh gantry where you look down, you can see the River Usk, 300 feet below you. I had to do it. Terrified me. A week later, I did it again. Mm. So I thought today, I can't put off not doing this show because I'm building up these invisible anxieties and, and things that, you know, catastrophizing, for want of a better phrase. And I thought, you know what? You just got to do it. Come with me to the football. It. it will kill any anxiety you have over, over um, being out there amongst people. <clears throat> I need some food. Right. On that yes. note, everybody, um, thank you for Indeed. watching and tuning in tonight. And as I say, hopefully you'll you'll go away from this and look up uh, the work of Louis Preneau because he was just uh, he was just a giant, um, you know, just a phenomenal, phenomenal talent. And 
Yes. Yeah, it's you know, it's it, it's a great loss to this hobby, and uh, and I think if you know if if the legacy is that people learn who he is and actually start appreciating the stuff that he did, you know, then I think that's uh, that's a, a way forward of remembering somebody who was not only a tremendous modeler but by all accounts just a really lovely guy as well yeah absolutely so on that note uh just to say thank you for watching as always look after yourself stay out of trouble we won't be back sunday but we might be back in small parcels on sunday so until then we'll see you very very soon take care of yourselves <laughs>